Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our session. We are emerging museum professionals, and we thought that um, we thought that this was a very useful. I was part of um, the Museum Association Emer Emerging Museum Professionals panel, and I thought it was a very valuable discussion. And what we, what I experienced with that, both the discussions and um, the panel itself. I took so much away from it that I thought that it was important to to have that again at the Scottish Museum Federation conference because I felt that these are um, things that we don't discuss enough and often EMPs are looked over. So um, I would like to first of all say a huge thank you to Scottish Museum Federation for um, letting me have this panel and running the session and to my panel for participating in it. I'm going to um, tell you guys a little bit about myself and we'll do introductions. And this is very informal. This is not a scripted session. I've deliberately not put too many slides. Uh, we have a few questions. We are going to have a discussion and you guys are welcome to interact with us and let us know what you guys think and if there's anything you guys want to say or you know, in between our questions. This is kind of like a very informal open thing. So my name is Shanila Shafiq and I am a gallery assistant at the Burrow Collection with Glasgow Museums. Um, I have not been in the sector very long, I believe eight months to be precise, um, less than a year. I'm new to the world of museums. I'm also first generation. I come from a working class family from the south of Glasgow and um, no one's been to university in my family and I grew up quite poor in Glasgow and people don't know who Rembrandt is in my family or museums and stuff like that and it was very tough for me to navigate this world um, and at the moment I'm very honoured and very proud to be Museum Association Scotland representative. They have really helped me um, navigate the sector by giving me this honour, by including me in their family and I will forever be very grateful to them for not just being so nice to me and being so inclusive um, as a person of colour, as a woman, as an older woman, um, but also just helping me open doors, showing me so many things. So. That's a little bit of my background. Um, I'm currently also studying history of art with Cambridge University online, and I'm finishing up the diploma year, and next year will be my dissertation. I did my undergrad um, in England and paid for it myself. I did my postgrad here in Glasgow MBA, paid for it myself. I had two jobs, and I'm paying for this degree whilst I work. Um, I chose Cambridge because I like the topics and the modules they covered and it's online and um, I can do it and it's a very reputable uni. Everybody knows knows Oxford and Cambridge and I thought it would also help me by for people to notice me when I went for things and they also made me feel very included and everything else and I love Dutch art in case you haven't you can't tell <laughs> and um, European art but I also have a huge passion for British art and British and German romanticism and um, art so it's the Western art that I'm interested in I just have um, lots of connections with the Netherlands and the Rijksmuseum and I know a lot of people there friends and family so I'm naturally inclined towards Dutch art um, so that's a little bit about me. Now I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues and they can do a little bit of um, their introduction. Hi, so um, some of you might have heard me speak earlier at the AGM. I'm Neve Finlay, currently the social media officer for the uh, Scottish Museums Federation, as well as being a museum and collections assistant at the Blackwatch Museum. Um, and I've come at this today basically coming from the perspective of somebody who's just graduated from the museum uh, and gallery studies course and sort of navigating that initial jump into the sector where you have to really fight for your place a lot of the time and it can be really, really tough to find your footing, um, especially when you can be quite overlooked and underestimated. Um, I'm 22 and a lot of the time I found myself being left out of conversations or just not being treated with respect in the sense that people think oh she's just like too young to have this experience or to know what she's talking about but 
I've worked very hard to be where I am and to be in this seat right now today. <laughs> and it actually, uh, this panel happened from SMF basically getting me a free ticket to come to the MA conference because we had a little stall there, which I would never have ever been able to afford to go to otherwise. Um, and I went to the EMP panel that Matt and Shanila were both on and asked a question about setting up an EMP network within the Scottish Museums Federation, um, which is still sort of moving in progress with and it's very slow, yeah. <laughs> but it sort of opened up this dialogue and discussion um, about all these different avenues that you can go into becoming an emerging museum professional. It's not just people um, in my position, it's also people who are undergoing a career change or have just decided that they want to be in this sector and they want to make those steps to moving further within it. Um, and this is all about how we can sort of encourage that inclusion and well-being for emerging museum professionals as well. Um, especially through things like networks, which leads on very nicely to Matt. Hi, Charles. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Matt, as you can see. Um, I, I've, got, I've got some notes on my phone, so I'm not being antisocial or anything. Um, um, a lot of this is to do with the first question, which I think we're going to answer in a bit. But um, I am threatening to derail the whole thing by saying that I've come to the conclusion recently that I'm actually maybe not an emerging museum professional anymore. So, um, so yeah, no. Um, not just because I'm 35 years old, which age doesn't matter and shouldn't matter really, but um, I've been doing this, working in the sector for over a decade, and I'm not suggesting that there's a time limit on being an emerging professional, but I kind of felt for a long time like um, it was a carrot in front of me, keep me going, to keep me sort of thinking that I have to achieve the next thing. And it was kind of to, you know, I think about that thing that David Bowie always said, who is a hero of mine and maybe a lot of other people in this room, that um, well, the moment you're in safe water, you're dead. And I th always thought the moment you think I'm done, I've at where I need to be, you're finished. So, and actually I, for a long time, was not where I wanted to be at all. I was always, uh, my the job I was in was always like the placeholder for where, I'm going to be, which is over there doing this sort of thing. Um, and I always felt a little embarrassed about where I was because it was like, I'm just doing this for a bit while, you know, and I'm still not fully there, but I'm a little bit more in that, I'm inching in that direction. I kind of feel like even though I'm not there, I kind of can let that go a little bit. And I'm not suggesting that this is only my experience really, but it's a good to have that goal to keep you going and maybe consider yourself emerging. But it's, it's a, it's a different old world, really. So um, I um, have set up the network, the EMPN, UK EMPN, it's a lot, a lot of letters, um, network. I did that last year. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And um, I currently work in Manchester at that thing behind me, which is an old abandoned viaduct that's been turned into a... I actually haven't worked in a museum since 2015, I realised the other day. I've worked in three historic houses and that. So... They're sort of museums, aren't they? But um, I'm sort of, I'm in that world, really. So we'll, I'll talk about, a little bit more about, um, about that. So. Thank you so much. And as you can see, the emerging museum professionals come in all shapes and sizes and ages. And we come from very um, different backgrounds. So we're a diverse bunch and anybody can be an emerging museum professional, whether if you're part time or full time or whether you've just graduated or whether if you are new to the sector or whether you've been in the sector for a very long time. Um, if, if you consider yourself an emerging museum professional, you are one. So thank you so much, you guys. Um, awesome. the, yeah. the previous one. So I had a, <laughs> would you like to, yeah, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions to my panel and please feel free to, if you guys have something to add after we're done, feel free to add your opinions and other things, I'd be quite happy or you can leave it till the end when we do the question and answer session. Um, but I would like a honest discussion over this. So my first question is, um, please tell us about yourselves and what it means to be an EMP. We've already done a little bit of that so uh, about ourselves, but I would like to add to this that to me an EMP is someone, it could be any age, like um, you guys said, that whether if you're changing sectors, whether if you're older or younger, I'm very new to the sector, so I consider myself an EMP. It's been less than a year. So I think in the first few years of your um, 
sector in your museum life, you're an EMP. And certainly if you graduate or if you're doing studies to do with museum studies and then right after that, you're also an EMP. So that's what I think. Is there anything you guys would like to add? <laughs> so I didn't realize we'd moved on. Um, so when I sort of set this thing up, I mean, the, the, the network that we've been doing hasn't quite done as much as we uh, we I plan to do this year, mainly because I've this year already I've uh, quit one job, gone travelling around Southeast Asia, come back, moved 100 miles up north and started a new job. And all of that took place before February the 9th. So it's been a bit of a busy old year. So I haven't got around to doing much. But the one thing we did do was a, um, a very informal meet, networking meetup in Manchester, which was you know, reasonably well attended, despite the fact that it was very, very um, quickly thrown together. Um, and at the thing, I sort of felt a little, um, it was a bit like the how do you do fellow kids meme. I felt a little out of place, really. And those people would go, go and, huh, I'm, I'm older than you, I'm 25. You know, um, and it kind of got me thinking, of course, as I've mentioned, and Janila mentioned that it's not to do with age at all. But I sort of felt, why am I doing this? Why am I so in invested in this kind of moving forwards? Why, why bother, really? Um, and it kind of made me think that if it's just a, a means to kind of put on networking events, like going to the pub or whatever, then I'm happy to sort of start it up, get people involved and then pass it on and walk, step away from it sort of thing. But if it's actually going to do something, have an impact and do something positive and practical and, um, and actually make a difference, then it's worth um, doing. So it's kind of, it's a way of sort of going, well, how, what's wrong with the sector? It, well, how can we affect change, outward change and inward change? It's the inward change. It's the, the you know, outward change is we're fine in, in, in museums, but it's sort of shining the light on back on ourselves, really. And how can we do that? And maybe the, the E, the emerging bit, is a bit of um, a bit of a misnomer, a bit of a red herring. Maybe it's, and it's, you take that bit out, it's UK museum professionals, which we all are, that makes sense. Emerging is a bit of a... A bit, a bit vague and a bit non-specific in a way, sort of thing. It's so it could refer to a, a load of people coming into the sector in their first few years, making their way. But it also could be the change that they bring with it. It could be the you know the the rough wind that, at the very least, rattles the windows of the sector, and at worst, you know, the best kind of knocks a whole house down and raises these these issues and these awareness things and emerging could it could easily the e could stand for emerged it could stand for experience it could stand for experiencing it could stand for every you know there's any number of words beginning with e that that, that word could stand for but and what i'm trying to achieve um and anyone else who's involved or wants to be involved um, can make that up as we go along really essentially so so yeah can i just say something as well um, just in response to this first question, um, they're telling you a bit about us. Um, being an emerging museum professional is incredibly important to me. Uh, I wanted to be a curator from the age of 10, <laughs> um, which is why I've had such a sort of speedy trajectory, I think, because I'm very, very determined. And what I've learned through going through the museums and galleries course and now starting my sort of adult life and um, devoting that to museums and the sector is that it's really not what you expect at all. Um, when you think about the word curator, it's you don't have to be a curator to be a museum professional. It's got so many branches within the sector that you just don't realize, I think, until you're really in it. Um, and for me personally, like it's always been this personal journey that that was my end goal. But now as I'm experiencing it and as I'm living it, I'm finding my niche, I'm finding my voice, which is something that's really, really key, I think, when you're an emerging museum professional, because it's all about that confidence and the confidence to believe in your own ability and the ideas that you have. And sometimes you can be bringing in something that's completely new to the sector. Even if you're experiencing a career change, it could be that you come from the financial sector and you've got all this experience that you wouldn't think is transferable to museums, but museums are businesses too. And it's incredibly transferable and useful for the whole sector to listen to these varied voices um, and for also for all of us to support each other as well. Um, but yeah, I think we're ready to move on to the second one. Thank you. So my second question to the panel is, what are some of the barriers, challenges EMPs face and how can we as a sector overcome them? Um, I think if I had to 
I'll start and give you guys some time to think. I think there are a lot of barriers that we have to face as EMPs. We have to navigate a sector sometimes blind without knowing um, who to connect with, what what path to follow, what should I be doing. Sometimes if you're a first generation, you don't know um, you you don't know how to um, what you should be doing or who you should be speaking with. So I think that there are so many barriers. There are financial barriers. Um, I personally, as an EMP, have experienced lots of barriers. There are barriers in terms of what background you have, where you come from. Um, there is a misconception um, that everybody knows what they're doing um, when they come into this certain fields. No, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we go in and we are very new and we have ideas. And so I think that it's emotional barriers and financial barriers and class barriers. I've experienced all of them. I am a black woman, a person of color um, that grew up in Glasgow and don't come from a family who are super educated or who know that you should apply for this grant or this is what you should do in uni or this is the support. I've never had any help from anybody. So the way I look at it is how I've dealt with the barriers that I've faced is I've just tried to read up on what other people are doing. I've tried to join networks. So SMF have been incredible. The Museum Association family have been incredible. Their website has an incredible amount of information. And um, if you, I'm always looking at Tamsin's things for, um, for how to navigate the sector and very grateful for her and the support that she's given to thousands of people. And I'm sure that there will come a time where I will need help too. So my, my advice would be that if you are facing these barriers and if you want to overcome them, connect with the right people that genuinely care about the sector. People from the MA family, people like Tamsin and her colleagues and in India, people from the SMF, um, read up on what you want to do and go in with an open heart and an open mind. And I always thought that that I would be a curator and I want to work with art. But now I'm, as I'm navigating the sector, I'm learning all, there are all these incredible roles. And I have a business background, I have an MBA, and I have done plenty of other things. So you can use your prior experience and don't um, put that to one side and think that it's irrelevant. It's not. I've just realized that it makes you a super museum professional if you have all these incredible experiences and education and life experiences and then it opens up so many avenues of jobs and everything else. So my advice is there's no such thing as a barrier that you can't overcome. Look for your look for people who can help you and assist you get forward. So Um, yeah, just to sort of add to what you were saying there, um, I feel like one of the barriers you can face as an EMP is that sense of loneliness and a, quite a big dose of imposter syndrome a lot of the time, especially from my experience coming out of, straight out of university basically and just being let loose in the world of museums. Um, it can sometimes feel really daunting and really lonely. And if I didn't have the support that I had from my SMF committee members when I first, like, decided to move to Scotland and leave all my family behind and my friends who live in London and my parents lived in Essex and sort of took that leap to move to Scotland and live on my own. And it was all because I felt I had that network of peer support to fall back on. And I always knew I could ask them a question or um, connect with them. And also it's beyond networking when everybody, especially in Scottish museums, I think all these museums are all connected to each other. You'll have people who've worked in one place and have moved to another and you'll find all these interconnected links and it can really, really open up that opportunity for experience as well. I think um, just trying to get as much volunteering experience as you possibly can, can really, really help you move forward with your museum's career. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, if you can find your niche and really put yourself forward and uh, 
find your voice to be able to project out your ideas and try new things basically as well. Um, that's how I think you can overcome those barriers, but definitely, definitely making use of those networks and the peer support that you can get in the museum's community. Like even this conference today is a great example of that kind of community that we've got in the museum sector. And I think it's fantastic. Um, right, Matt, here you go. Um, in terms of barriers and challenges, well, how, how long have we got? We could, we could fill, <laughs> fill a whole hour just talking about them, really. Um, so I keep it brief. You know, there's a lot of things that um, affect people in the sector generally, like uh, the obviously the low wages or the wages not being very good, um, the often lack of opportunities, the lack of diversity in some areas, um, that sort of thing. Um, there's there's things that this net I want this network to do, which is sort of properly addressing issues and kind of raising awareness and kind of doing research into things like um, I was having a conversation with someone about the, the effect of the cost of living on museum in workers um, about why people leave the sector as well um, but a, may have put a proposal in for a certain conference which got haven't heard anything back about that but anyway because um, um, it makes me think that a lot of, there was quite a few people in the sector, not people in the sector, but the sort of thing about the sector, of, as I mentioned, of change being outward change and sort of not really kind of um, discussing problems within with the, the actual staff in the sector. Um, one thing I will, I do want to talk about though is is the um, I didn't feel like I was a, an emerging professional probably until about two or three years into my well the, the wreckage of what you can call a career. Um, I was I was kind of very much in where I was and I wasn't thinking outside of that until I really started to um, uh, link up with people and to kind of join the, the training courses and the one day events and the drinks meetups and the conferences and things like that and I've, that's when I really started to feel part of something bigger um, than, than just me and my little place um, and social media was of course a big example of that in particular Twitter and um, that has been well, I'd say from about, you know, up until about a year ago, from the seven, six, seven, eight years before, that was really a way I got out to people and got to know people and um, joined in with the debates and turned up to the events and, you know, retweeted things at conferences and sort of, you know, shared the silly memes of absolute units and things like that. Um, and... You know, I got to know all these people and they got to know me and, you know, I got so many followers as a result of that um, and, you know, many great contacts, some friends, some very good friends, one or two dates, even an ex-girlfriend um, as well. So that was useful. Um, and then I felt, and I don't know if I'm the only one who thinks this, certainly in terms of Twitter, um, certain um, thin-skinned, egomaniacal billionaires came and bought the thing and it's crap now. <laughs> Anyone agree? Thank you. Um, and this thing that was so helpful to me and a lot of other people, particularly during COVID and when we were all kind of not able to be in, in the room with each other, um, it was... It was a it was a real sort of comfort in a way to have that thing of you can talk to people and you can still be in touch with people and everything and and that to me is sort of just kind of gone basically and it's not to say that people aren't doing stuff online on Twitter and things like that um, but in terms of uh, museum stuff um, they're still t um, posting about it but. I don't see a lot of this stuff anymore and I feel like people don't see me a lot of, uh, anymore and there's people who I've been following and people who have been following me and I don't, I don't, I could, for all I know, they've, they've got not, not on Twitter anymore and it's a real problem and they are, they're just, I don't see it anymore. Um, and maybe I shouldn't think a lot about this sort of thing, but when Neve was saying that about sort of that, that sense of isolation, I think that's a really... That's, that's a really dispiriting thing and a really disheartening thing and feeling like you're alone and you're not there and the the tools that you're using aren't really working for you. So um, so anyway, um, that's another thing. I will basically set, um, say that I'm set up for this network a mailing list. Um, I've got the things here, actually. Um, it's So I've set this up basically in the last week or so and I'll pass them around. It's a QR code. Um, Apparently free QR codes that last more than seven days don't exist and you have to pay for them. So that's a second QR code because I'm not doing that. Um, so it's a way of my way of kind of getting around and getting a more direct form of kind of engagement with people. And so getting a sort of new kind of my attempt to subvert certain things which may fail. Um, so I'll pass them around if you want to be a part of that. It's um, 
it's a it's a, a work in progress. It could be a failed experiment. Um, it, I need someone to run it because I'm you know someone competent to run that sort of thing. Um, and there's no content yet, but we'll work on it. Um, and also check your junk mail because it'll probably fall into there. So there you go. Thank you. I'm going to add one quick thing to what Matt and um, Neve said. So I have a social media too, and I use it predominantly for research. And I use it for my, when I'm stuck on a train or a bus or when I'm taking a study break. So I look at a lot of um, visual art on it and poetry. But I, I have found it very helpful to make contacts uh, with real life people that I know, a lot of my real life friends are on it. People that I hang out with or have coffee with or have lunches with. So I do find social media is very helpful. Um, so utilize it, but my advice would be, don't take it too seriously. It's not the end of the world. It's just, um, it's, it's a nice way. I start a lot of my rough research on social media before I go on to serious stuff. So if I'm looking for artworks or if I'm studying something or writing about something, because visual images are very important as an art historian. But you're right, Matt, the, the algorithm, sometimes I don't see my friends' things. So if you are my friend, especially a real life friend that I hang out with or have coffees with, please tag me if you um, if I if you want me to have a look at something. If if I end up missing something, I always say to people that I honestly don't know. So especially anyone else as well. If anyone's looking at incredible Dutch art, tag me and I'll retweet it because. I use predominantly Twitter for reading love poems and in between looking at visual analysis artwork. And then in between there's real life friends that I know their families and they know my families and other stuff. But you're right, social media is a great tool. But sometimes it's since there's a lot of changes that's happened to it. And uh, we can be, yeah. So there's one more thing that, um, firstly, I don't actually use it that often. I don't me down as that um the, what the other uh, thing is is that support networks are really important and um if my advice is if there's a support support network that you feel doesn't exist create it um so when i was listening to amy's talk about um neurodivergent museums and she said there's a neuro neurodivergent museums network fantastic more of that simple really if you feel like it's not there create it so my last question quickly to the panel is what do museums mean to you and how can we give ourselves and each other support both professionally and personally? I'm going to answer that very quickly. That's an easy one. Um, museums to me mean freedom and credible research, discovery, and I love museums. I've also lo I also love libraries. I've come from the world of libraries. Museums just took longer to break into. But museums are places full of passion and incredible research and things and objects. And for me, I found myself in museums. So they mean a lot to me. And anyone that works in museums means a lot to me. And I'm always ready to help. And how can we help each other professionally and personally? Um, I'm always happy to, to meet with people and talk about museums and art. So please connect with me on LinkedIn or, or on Twitter or in real life in person. If you see me at a conference, I'm very open and very honest and very transparent with my dealings with everyone. And I like people who are also non-judgmental and open about things. Um, and I'm very tolerant. I'm becoming a Dutch art historian, so that should say something. And um, how can we help each other? Just be kind. There's, there's a lack of that in the world. We must be kind. We do not know what the other person they're going through, um, what they're walking in their shoes and what they're experiencing. I'm always kind, not just to myself, but to others and anyone that encounters me. I always give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And I always think that we should all have kindness for each other in the world of museums going forward. That's all we need. So. Um, yeah, so looking at this question, um, obviously museums are so important to all of us in this room. Um, and I feel like they really are, especially now 
becoming proper community spaces and community hubs for sharing stories and keeping history and heritage alive as well as keeping uh, audiences intrigued and uh, involved as much as possible. Um, and in terms of uh, EMPs, ways we can sort of support each other professionally and personally, I think in our institutions, we should make spaces for new ideas and new voices. And even something as simple as letting your gallery assistants have some time to speak with the trustees or with the director and maybe put forward some new ideas as the people who are there interacting with the audience and the visitors every day, they might shed some fresh perspective and have different life experiences and things that can really be taken advantage of in museums, um, but are often overlooked and not given that space to sort of share their ideas. Um, and like Shanila said, just supporting each other in a personal way, like making friendships, building relationships with people, um, not necessarily even in institutions like yours. It could be a museum that deals with a completely different set of objects, completely different history to your museum, and you never know they could partner with you on an exhibition if you can find a theme that interconnects you. And it might be a really new, exciting way to display your objects and things like that. Um, and using networks like the EMP network um, that Matt set up or using the Scottish Museums Federation as just a place to have open dialogues and open conversations. Like if you're struggling with something, you can speak to somebody who's had almost exactly the same experience as you. I know for a fact, a lot of the people that I was at university with are still struggling to find their place in the museum sector, despite all their experience, despite all their talent. Sometimes it can just come down to shyness in interviews or, just the wrong place at the wrong time and you miss those opportunities but it doesn't reflect on your own personal talent or skill it's just about having these networks having the support and trusting your gut with a lot of things as well and sort of being there for each other I think because going through the interview process and job application process can be incredibly slow and incredibly taxing and especially when you're just getting rejection after rejection after rejection, especially in the museum's world. I feel like if you have that space where you can talk to other people who are also dealing with all this rejection and just want a place to vent, it can be great just to have that conversation with other people who have similar interests to you. And you never know, it might lead to a new opportunity if you've built that new relationship. So that's how I would answer that question. Thank you. Um, I've, I'll try and be quick about it because I think we're running a bit, running a bit over. Um, in terms of well, the, um, these um, the Janila and Neve both said about the the networking, and I'm a big um, proponent of talking and getting to know people and situations like this where you know, um, and in a way, part of the reason I, I'm, I believe in that because I've usually been so bad at getting to know people and kind of breaking that wall down, and so I know really how important that kind of thing is. Um, in, it's difficult to answer the question what museums mean to me because in a in a strange sort of way I, I'm still figuring that out I guess but um, I I'm interested I sort of every now and again sort of say to people why museums and I don't mean that in a kind of why bother kind of flippant kind of way but sort of why what is it about it and um, and it, what well my answer to that is personally is it's either the best thing I can say to you or the worst thing I can say to you is is I think of what my um, granddad who died about. Through, yeah, three years ago said, which is do what you want to do and the money will come. Now, it's easy to apply, you know, that kind of to, to and it's, you know, say it in, in, in theory and not in practice, but, um, and I will never begrudge anybody who feels like the sector isn't for them or they have to do something else for whatever reason or they, you know, they can't make it pay for itself or whatever. And I, it saddens me, but I do understand it. But maybe I do have a sort of naive belief in that sort of, thing of finding something which really makes you get out of bed every morning excited about what you're going to be doing uh, you know that day um and not sort of go thinking well you know i get this job because it, pay, it gives these opportunities and pays me all this this even though i actually hate it and i sort of do have that belief in the idea of kind of finding the thing that just makes really inspires you to to do that sort of thing really and um I mean, it's, frankly, if we're doing it for the money, we've all picked the wrong wrong sector, haven't we? Um, I, or you know, we could be a director, but I couldn't direct traffic, so you know. Um, so it's it's just being it's it's a very and also that thing that does interest me. And I sort of when people ask me what you do, and I say, you know, I work in in heritage in museums, and it's well, it could get extreme examples, but when it gets a kind of a oh, okay, that's a really interesting sort of thing, and you think actually. 
it's a lot more interesting than working in a bank. It's a lot more interesting than working, you know, for an insurance company, really, isn't it? So that's my answer to that uh, in a sort of random way. And Thank you so much to Matt and Neve, and thank you so much to you guys and uh, for listening. And I'm very grateful that you guys have listened to us and have a little chat. We don't have time for questions, but at the end of the conference, please feel free to find us if there's anything you guys want to discuss. Thank you to Konya for doing the slides. I'm going to pass this over. Thank you.